Hey y'all, and welcome to Rotten Tomatoes is Wrong. I'm Jacqueline Coley, an editor at Rotten Tomatoes, where I cover independent film and awards. I'm Mark Ellis. I'm a stand-up comic and Rotten Tomatoes correspondent, and regrettably, a member of the Sky People. It's okay. You're one of the nicer ones. I will say Thank that. You were the, the guy with the lab coat who was like the secret spy. Okay, folks, yes. for folks that don't know, <laughs> we are hinting about the billion dollar, you know, technical wonder, James Cameron's opus of space and CGI. We're talking Avatar. And we have to give a huge shout out to three, count them, three fans who suggested this one for us today. Um, give them a personal shout out to Nick Velasquez, Johan Gustafsson, and Paul Bratz. They all requested Avatar. Thank you, gentlemen, so, so much for reaching out. This is just a gentle reminder that any of you can make suggestions for what we talk about on RT is Wrong. You can just email us at RT is Wrong at RottenTomatoes.com. All right, Mark, this film has had a bit of a roller coaster. It was 82% certified fresh. The audience score is literally exactly the same. So you would think that this would be a beloved movie all around the board, but it's not. It's had such a different like turn between Papyrus and a lot of the way folks have talked about it. You know, there's a lot of folks in the camp of this movie sucks. Where are you? I think it's really, really good. And I didn't know I had that opinion until I rewatched it for this episode, because like everyone else in the world, I went to go see the movie in theaters at some point around the holiday season when it was released. And I was excited about the technical aspect of it. I wanted to see this visual effects Marvel. Obviously, I'm a big James Cameron fan from way back in the Aliens days. And you see what he's able to pull off and is an experience in the theater, it was overwhelming. It was awesome, but maybe it was so overwhelming, I didn't know if I really cared about the story or if I just felt like it was reductionist and I'd seen this before. I rewatched it, and I had such a good time. I was so locked in. I was impressed at how the special effects and everything, all the, the performance capture holds up to this day, but I also really got ingratiated into the story and I found myself emotionally attached to the Navi in a way that I don't remember being when I saw it in the theater so this is definitely a very fresh movie for me I think that tomato meter and audience score at 82 percent right on really that yeah. is not where I would put this in my brain first of okay. all I do enjoy this movie quite 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 hmm. a bit I don't want to in any way uh say that I don't um, but my enjoyment of it is very mixed. It is like shock and awe, like shock at the just great CGI and awe at like everything with the narrative. Like, oh, don't do that. Don't do that. Why are y'all doing that? Why is this a decision that we have made? And I think there's a lot of folks that feel the exact same way that I do, but are they more on the awe side? I don't know, Lucy, where are you at? I loved it when I first saw it, when it first came out. I don't. Love it anymore. I just, the whole like attachment tale to animals thing and like the weird groans made me uncomfortable. <laughs> it okay, ruined the this whole is, movie I, for I me. feel like I'm going to be outnumbered on the show. Let me just get this <laughs> off my chest real quick. I'm going to give everybody listening a little synopsis of the film and I'm just going to remind them what is at stake here with Avatar because we're not just talking about, oh, we need to save somebody. We need to rescue a king. We need to save a princess. We have this planet Pandora, and it's a really cool planet. The people, the Navi tribe, they're all in touch with nature, and there's a lot of cool other animals, and occasionally you can find your, um, your significant other-ish in the form of a flying pterodactyl, and then that's your buddy. That's your car for life. And then humanity. Oh, God, we just cannot keep our fingers out of the pudding. So a bunch of Marines and a bunch of scientists set up a base camp on Pandora, and they're looking to not necessarily colonize. At least that's not what they're saying. They just want to mine some really valuable stuff called unobtainium. Yes, it's called unobtainium. And in doing so, we're going to kind of upset the locals and there's going to be some strife. And so then that's when the Marines come in and enter Sam Worthington, who has a debilitating injury and that he's a paraplegic. And so he has to kind of take over the role that his brother was going to have on this mission because they have the same genome. 
that role being we're literally implanting your consciousness into this body that we're growing that is also from local Navi tribe DNA. What does all this mean? We want to get some of our Navi to make cool with the locals and to kind of explain to them, hey, we need you to get off this land because there's going to be some really scary Marines coming to obtain some unobtainium if you don't. Hell ensues and we're off on our adventure. I think... That's it, it's a tough movie to give a synopsis of. It is about three hours long. So to your defense, even you. if that was just like, you know, a trip down memory lane for you, it's hard movie to sort of like <laughs> all the way encompass. There's a lot of people who have sort of changed their opinion about this movie. Some people hated it from the beginning. Uh, but our guest, I don't know if he hated it from the beginning or, you know, grew to dislike it, but I'm very excited to have him back because he's always incredible and we've had him here before. Of course, we're talking the Swaggy Blurred. You can find his YouTube channel and podcast, Blurreds in the Hood, with another friend of the podcast, Mr. Jay Washington, where they chat about all things pop culture, sports, and more from the Blurred perspective. Please welcome back to the show, Mr. Winston A. Marshall. Hey, Thank sir. Thank you, Thank you, thank you, thank you for that lovely intro. Um, and and to answer your question up top, it's definitely more all hell gnaw than anything else for me. That's that's uh, that's you that's gotta put what the this... gnaw on it. That's fitting. Exactly, you gotta put that's the fitting. hell gnaw. Because <laughs> I, hell that's, gnaw on I it. just. Mm. Mm -mm -mm. But did you did you dislike the movie from the beginning or was this something that you came to later? I'm just curious real quick before we, we go further. Like if this was one of those scales, like when you go to FedEx and they give you like a, 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 a like, can you do the fill out the survey? Like were you very satisfied, satisfied, whatever, like not really satisfied or I will never shop at this place again. I was at the not very satisfied and now I'm at the we don't need no sequels wow that's, that's 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 where my brain's at. went from bad to worse okay well if i think back to me back then i didn't even see this at the theater which we will get into when we discuss this movie i was the one person that didn't see it it was a movie that haunted me for two years was everyone's like you didn't see avatar everybody saw avatar my grandma saw avatar but Let's take ourselves back to 2009 with our review curation manager, Tim Ryan. He's going to tell us what the critics and audiences were saying at the time and maybe why folks' opinion of the movie has shifted over time. Thank you, Jacqueline. When Avatar was released in 2009, there's not really a universe in which you could say it wasn't a complete success. It was the highest grossing film of all time. It was nominated for Best Picture. It's certified fresh at 82% on the tomato meter with 318 reviews, and it's got an 82% audience score. So basically, everybody was like, yeah. And I'll tell you, when I saw it, when it came out, I actually ran into uh, an elementary school classmate in the, in the lobby afterwards. And I looked at him and I said, what'd you think? And he said, yeah. And I said, yeah, we were basically promised this visual masterpiece and it delivered on that front. And we were also told that it was derivative of a bunch of things from Fern Gully to Dances with Wolves to The Wizard of Oz to Yes album covers to the visual language of video games. And we got that too. And the critics were pretty much of those two camps, sometimes right in the middle that, yeah, it's a visual masterpiece. And yeah, it's got dialogue that is nothing to write home about, and the story is pretty derivative. So what did the critics have to say? In a fresh review, Charlie Jane Anders of io9 wrote, It's one of the most vivid, visceral movies you've ever seen. It's cheesy enough for 10 Swiss villages. It's James Cameron delivering an action thrill ride at the top of his game. It will transform the way you think about movies forever. However, in a rotten review, Moral McDonald of the Seattle Times wrote, Everyone recites their lines, awkwardly laying out exposition, speaking their clunky dialogue. None of this is supposed to matter because we're presumably busy marveling at all the money on display. So yeah, when Avatar came out, it was properly rated. And today, that seems like the consensus still. Back to you, Jacqueline. Oh, man. You know, it's good that Tim uh, talked about the technological achievement because we're going to get into it. But yeah, people, I think, now are easier to rail against it because they forget how odd they were the first time they saw it. I mean, like... Think about like YouTube was two years old <laughs> when this thing was like hitting theaters. I don't know, Mark, were you like, are, were you still odd with it now when you watched it again with the visuals? I was arguably more odd now when I was watching it on my gorgeous 75 inch TV because I, I, 
it, it wasn't the spectacle that that was overwhelming me. When I saw it in the theater, I almost felt like I was at a rock concert with a band I was really excited to see, but the guitar's amp was so loud that I couldn't hear the drums or the lead singer or the bass or the keyboards or anything else. And so I felt like the effects and the the shock, as you say, Jacqueline, kind of overwhelmed me and and I didn't really get as invested into the story as I might have otherwise because there's just so much to look at and that takes precedence. So I didn't do my due diligence, I guess, and go back to the theater to give this movie more and more billions of dollars time and time again. I saw it once and I thought it was a, a, type, a stunning achievement and I moved on with my life and, and I didn't even think I needed sequels at that point. But upon rewatching it and knowing what I was getting into with the Feast for the Eyes angle and trying to get more into the story, see if I could get to, I found I really glommed onto it. I felt emotional a number of times watching the movie. I, I was full on rooting for the Navi tribe in a way that I don't remember doing beforehand. I hated the Marines even more than I did when I saw it 10 years ago. And so, yeah, everything about this movie, it really got its claws into me this time. Um, I'm not going to ask you if you had a CBD infused beverage before you watched it. <laughs> I'm not going to ask you that. I'm not okay. going to ask don't, you that. Don't however, ask me because however, I, I, I do know what the answer was. <laughs> however, <laughs> I have my guesses. But I mean, I don't know. Winston, you recently rewatched it. When you recently saw it again, what what were the scenes that stuck out to you? that maybe made you forgive it a bit or were, or what were the scenes where you were like, no. I'll tell you what immediately made me go, man. I, I First of all, I forget, I forget cause I haven't been on here in a while. Is this a show that we're allowed to cuss or not? Do I need to like temper myself? I think you can curse, we'll bleep you out. So let, it, let it go, that's... let it go. Okay, you can, right. you can cuss, but probably no F words. Yeah, no F words. <laughs> I was just about to drop the MF word. All right, that's fine, Ooh. I won't, I won't. When Frank Buffet told me that he was out here trying to get unobtainium, <laughs> I immediately checked out. I, I opened my phone so fast and started watching TikToks. I was like, you know what? Maybe this is why, maybe this is why my 21 year old ass wanted nothing to do with this movie, man. Like That's I, early too. That's that's the first 20 minutes. He goes, so like, yeah, Fr Frank break Buffet's it down, like, yeah. huh, huh, uh, you know those tw those triplets I had? Okay, here's the deal. Uh, I need to pay for them. So I need you to go get unobtainium. Uh, and it's underneath where, you know, all these indigenous people are. So handle that. I need you to go and make America happen again and get these indigenous people up out here so we can have the resources. And it's, again, unobtainium. Like, bro. I get that it's really hard to obtain this mineral because it's only in like one place on this entire planet, but like you couldn't have called a scientist and be like, make up an element for me. <laughs> like you just, you just, you just, you just were like, I, I can't, it's really hard to obtain. That's, that's how we're going to name this. Like, like you're supposed to be one of the greatest writer directors of all time. And Breakfast. that's what you went with. That's what you went with. Uh, like, Bro, this was this was Space Gully, all right? This was this was uh 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 if the show reboot was was just giving a few extra bells and whistles, that was this. You know what I mean? Wait like, a minute, I bring just... folks back to reboot for folks that don't know. So for those of us that were friends of nineties Saturday morning cartoons, reboot was about uh essentially going into a computer system like the Matrix of a giant video game, and it was this 3D rendered like superhero that was like stopping uh like uh, a virus from the the negaverse i believe is what it was i may be confusing my shows right now but essentially it, it was the same kind of cgi look to this um and it is kind of have like an a similar avatar matrix like uh mentality as far as like jacking into stuff and so this looks like updated like mind you significantly updated but i would notice at times when jake was like trying to learn like movements and maybe this is the thing with like having 4k now i know that cgi has continued to improve over the last decade but it's very glaring how sometimes the movements can be a little robotic while they're tr where they were trying to be fluid i think I, as the beginning of that technology i can see where that would be fascinating at the time 
but having played Final Fantasy VII Reboot and and all that kind of stuff, this is this doesn't hold up in that regard. We have advanced a decent amount. Like I got a PS4 now. I don't even have the five, and the four is blowing this out the water. So, okay, here's my here's my hot take though. Is that and this is gonna get me in a lot of trouble with all the MCU fans. Is that we recently did an episode on Avengers: Age of Ultron, right? And I rewatched that, and now I rewatched Avatar. I thought that the fluidity in movements as far as the cgi goes looked a lot cleaner on my tv with avatar than it did avengers age of ultron and it wasn't even close and so that's one of the things that impressed me do i know it's not real yes would it have been more believable if i had clunky 3d glasses on my face and a giant theater screen sure but that's the case with any movie and sticking with the mcu there's some pretty silly element names in the mcu there's vibranium there look unobtainium is a stupid name it is a very stupid name, but it is not so stupid that it's going to make me check out of the movie because that first 20 minutes, it, it, it moves at such a quick pace. It's showing you around this new world, and I felt like I was Jake where I'm just overwhelmed by all this, but I'm kind of excited by all this technology. I mean, Winston, I'll just say, uh, to your point, there is a lot of sampling from the sci-fi buffet in this movie. I will give you that. Sure, to your point, yeah. they're taking a little Fern Gully. They're taking a little Stargate. Like, that was the one that I, like, was immediately like, okay, yeah, this is this is Stargate. Matrix, yeah. There's a lot that it's robbing from it. Pocahontas, because, excuse me. Pocahontas, yeah, Pocahontas, exactly. Pocahontas. No, I just there, had a little there's... frog in my throat. I just, yes, I, I just coughed, exactly. So. <laughs> like they are, they are definitely taking a little bit of a buffet from good things in other properties. However, think about the details of like, think about that little animal that turns and it spins. Um, there's a scene very early on when Jake and uh, Naturi are like kind of like, walking through the forest and that little thing like turns there's a body underneath that that thing took like 10 designers just to make that little creature there's a level of detail to this that is really stunning and i i don't think it can be passed over just because we've seen thanos beat up the world like i know that we have moved past this now but there are moments in the movie that really sort of like i think are incredible including especially the ending like if you stick the landing we can forgive a lot and the ending of avatar is absolutely incredible i love that scene so much it bookends from the earlier scene where they try to give grace selvig who's played by sigourney weaver uh the transfer her body into her avatar through awa you know they go to the the cool tree with the with the electric ports and all the people come together and they're trying to bring her through there when they do that at the end and jake sully opens his eyes i'm not gonna lie to you i live for that moment so so much because it is setting up the next four movies in a way that i am so excited about it's like the moment after daniel says he's gonna stay in stargate you're like this sounds good in theory <laughs> But what's going to happen when you wake up and realize there's no penicillin? What are you going to do when you realize that there is no 7-Eleven Slurpees at two o'clock in the morning and no donuts? Like there's just so many things. Like I know it's the Navi and like you're one with the earth, but I really, really like cappuccinos. Anyway, whatever. <laughs> Same thing here. Same exact feeling. And I will tell you why, Winston. It's because I'm just going to make every comic book movie fan hate me now because I thought that the eye opened because the end of the film, we think Jake might eat it because not 30 minutes ago, Sigourney Weaver's character, Grace, tried a similar thing where the nature of, of Pandora, the actual planet itself, can attempt to heal a human and get their consciousness into permanently into a Navi body. Didn't work with her. We're hoping it can work with Sam Worthington's character. The very end of the movie, the last shot is him as this new Navi opening his eyes. And that was done so much better than that little coffin movement with the dirt floating at the end of Batman oh, v Superman. Percent. A thousand and, percent. And it just, it, it, it did this time get me excited for the sequel. And, and I was like, oh, God, yeah, I, I want to have more adventures. 
But what? But what? What's next? He wakes up and, like you said, he does wake up for a craving at at Seven Eleven, and then he also realizes he has to pee, and then all of a sudden he's like, "Well, damn, now I gotta pee on this tree. I ain't got nowhere to go. Ain't no, ain't no, no running water or nothing." Like, I couple things. First of all, you gonna come for vibranium? At least that makes sense. At least vibranium is describing what the element yes. mainly does. Yes, Unobtainium, it does. you went, you named it that because you can't get it. That's what that is. That would be like instead of naming it Bitcoin, you were like, "Yo, let me get that digital money." That's what I want. I got, I invested so much in digital money. That's stupid. I miss me with that. But a, a broken clock is right twice a day. All right, that eye opening thing, that whole scene, that zoom in of seeing the entirety of the tribes coming together and Jake moving. That is a beautiful scene. The mating scene uh, between uh, between Jake and uh, uh, I always mispronounce her name N uh, Natiri. Is that it? Natiri is Natiri. is my it, it, dumb, very reductionist pronunciation. <laughs> of the name. That that whole lead up to that, like I, I you know the again those spinning those spinning bug animals, whatever those are, that was beautiful. Like the actual being in the wish tree, I guess is what we're kind of calling it. Though I don't know, we want to stay away from wishes now. Uh, after a recent movie that we're talking, we're talking about comic book movies. I'm not trying to get into more fights. Uh, you know, like that whole scene is beautiful. I think the the final fight scene, so the ambush of the Marines and everything, I think that that is phenomenal. So there's a lot of stuff in here to look at and go, wow, this is pretty amazing. That does not take away from all sorts of random things. Like you started off with such a positive theme of like, your way of thinking isn't always necessarily the best way of thinking, right? And then it goes full, just white savior. All of a sudden it's like, well, I'm gonna have to be the one that leads you to the other side. I, you know what I'm saying? Like, I don't need that. I do not need that in my life right now, man. So like, I just, uh, I don't know. I, I just. I feel you on that. I, I, watching this just from my, from my perspective, it, it felt less like a, a white savior movie because as I'm watching it, I just felt a lot of white guilt. <laughs> this was like a, so, so I would say this is less white savior, more white guilt, white apologist, because it's not like, this isn't like that Matt Damon great wall movie where, uh oh, we need to fight this dragon. Let's call Matt Damon. This was where this dude gets thrown into a situation where he thinks he's on the right team. So he's very similar. His character arc feels similar to Finn from The Force Awakens, where he thought he was on the right team, wasn't really sure, didn't really pay attention to the, the ethics of it, the, the morality of it. Just, okay, it's a gig. I've been raised to do this. Let's do the job. And then he has a change of heart. And so he's not saving the Navi from something that is it, in, it, like inherently wrong with their planet. He's saving them from more people like him. So having a change of heart is something that we all wish we would have. So this is, and it takes from a lot of movies before it, where the character has the change of heart that we all think that we would have in that situation. It's like you see grainy cell phone footage of somebody being mugged and then somebody saves them on the street. And we all think, yeah, that's who I would be in that situation. Would we? Probably not but we want to be. And so I can get behind Jake because I'd like to think that's the kind of person I would be, even if my own race, even if my own species of people was perpetrating it, you'd like to think you can go against them, but it's probably tougher to do in practice than it is in watching a movie and having a beverage and saying, oh yeah, 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 yeah I do that. It's wish fulfillment. It's wish sure. fulfillment. Sure. Like that's what it is. Like when you are watching him run at the very early scene when um, they find, they put Jake in the body for the first time, which by the way, on Winston's side, which I'll have you comment on this next, there's, that's a lot of the things I was having. It's like, why did y'all not tell him anything? Like, they're just like, we're gonna put you in here, not tell you what we're doing. And then when you go run off like a crazy person, we're gonna all be shocked. <laughs> oh, come on, you ain't got no skills. <laughs> Oh, oh, so cool. I don't even have to play defense on Hey, guys. Oh. Hey. It's okay. I'll get him. Jake, you have to come Jake. back. Jake. Jake. Oh, Excuse me. Hello. <sighs> what? Uh, sorry. Come on. Jake. We're not supposed to be running. <laughs> like, what the hell? There's so many times where there was a lack of explanation before something crazy happens. Like the scene where he gets the pterodactyl, homegirl doesn't tell him until he's literally standing in front of them that he's gonna attack you. 
first. Sansi you! Dokurazi Sansi you! Like, that doesn't make any sense. So, I, I don't know. I was never really a fan with the fact that, like, they wait to the end to give this vital information. But I, it is wish fulfillment. You want to have those moments where people put their their finger in the dirt. It's Daniel putting his hands through the water in Stargate. Sorry, it's yes, my Stargate favorite obsessed. Scene is, it, well, one, one of my favorite scenes is, this whole movie is my favorite scene. I just, I, I, I'm in love with this movie. It, it might it might be infatuation. <laughs> the, the, this might be a movie that I start dating and it's really intense and I tell y'all, hey, Winston Jacklin, I think I'm going to put a ring on this finger and y'all are like, okay, Mark, you need to take a breath here, okay? it's <laughs> Yes. It, it, you've been quarantined too long. You think you're feeling something you're not because... That scene was so cool. Just, I, I love that mythology that you have to find your match. It's, it's like buying yeah. a car. You, you, you get yeah. to the lot and you got to see the one that really speaks to you. You know, do I want to get another Ford Fusion or man, that Mustang looks like it's looking at me with his headlights. Let me see if my tail works in there. Wait a minute, Mark, please keep going. But I just love how Mark went to finding the perfect car as in most people would think about finding their soulmate. A Porsche or, 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 or a, a Mercedes. Mark, He's like... I got to upgrade from that Ford Fusion, baby. I yeah, want no. that Mustang. That's the <laughs> first That's the first part. The second, Mr. I'm going to put a ring on it. Uh, here's here's how, what I'll tell you. I'll show up at the wedding. I'm not going to like it. And when the pastor asks me, does anybody have an objection? I may just stand up. It depends on how much Hennessy I've had before I came to your wedding. That's, that's essentially what it's coming down to this. All right. Him I and want... Jay are going to do a dual objection with like, it is going to be like the dudes from Trading Places. One of them's talking. The other one's like, yeah. I want Winston. <laughs> Winston is my best man. And Winston, as she's walking down the aisle, is whispering to me, you know, you can still back out of this, right? Exactly. You can still get out of it. To quote, to quit, to quote Audrey 3000, don't do it. Reconsider. Read some, read some litter. litter. Sure, sure. On the subject. You sure? I'm not, <laughs> I'm not backing out right now. This is something I feel in my soul. And I feel like this movie maybe is my weird pterodactyl that I plug my tail into because the, I, I do like how they threw Jake into that situation. I, I, th I think that was a smart play by the Navi to not tell him, give him the playbook like, hey, this is what we're going to do. Uh, just put, He clearly has shown himself as somebody who is so excited to just be walking again that I'm just going to try this thing. And look, for the Navi, if he fails and falls to his death, all right, it, it, it's one less thing we got to worry about. He, he, he finds his creature and it's kind of like if you wanted to get a pet and you and you see the one that that maybe connects with you the most and it's just this thrilling scene it reminded me of like how to train your dragon where where you find your match and you now you're flying through and it just like now you have your magic carpet now you have your falcor for life and it just resonated with me so hard what a cool thing that is to come up with that that that's sort of war I thought really helps build the world away from just being this effects masterpiece into something that I actually care about with my soul. That's right. You're mine. <laughs> First flight seals the bond. You cannot wait. Think, fly. Fly. To that point, man. I look at look at you. You know, you brought up Force Awakens. So just Star Wars in general. Look at like the Phantom Menace, for example. All right, or look at uh, Attack of the Clones. Like you look at that and you go, wow, the the world building out is pretty crazy. We're getting more like in depth about what we're getting out of the Star Wars universe and whatnot. And then you get, uh, you know, like, I don't like sand. It gets everywhere. Oh my, like, you know what I'm saying? Like that that's, that's dialogue. That's that like th this, this hamstrings this movie so hard with the dialogue in this stuff, man. Like they are telling you to watch it on mute. 
that and that that's a problem like that's a massive problem if i just wanted to see cutscenes like that you could have just shown me that you're you're like become a video game designer bro like what what are we doing here like i don't i don't mind it it's a different form of storytelling listen this is what it is. James Cameron is like anti Quentin Tarantino in the sense that both of them do the same thing as far as borrowing, but James does it from things that everybody knows. Quentin does it from things that nobody knows. Oh, I thought James you were going to say, Qu it. I thought you said Quentin does it by throwing the N word in there every. No, I mean, he does do that too. <laughs> but no, but no, but like if you look at Quentin Tarantino, people accuse him of doing the same thing of robbing from other movies like kung fu movies and old spaghetti western movies and things like that and uh crime thrillers and james does the same thing but he does it for movies that everybody has seen he does it for these like obscure you know kurosawa and like uh sergio Leone movies and so people don't know but the difference is tarantino cares the most about the dialogue and cameron does not give a flip about the dialogue how how i got a question though how do i care more about a boat sinking for three hours than i do for an entire, for not even the coolest Pandora that we know. Like there's Pandora's box, there's Pandora the planet from from Borderlands. Like this is my third favorite, pa this is my fourth favorite Pandora. Cause I use the third one to listen to music. I don't understand how- Oh, you don't want to put the jewelry in there too? Yeah, I was going to throw the jewelry before. store in yeah, there. Yeah, I'm yeah, about yeah, to go yeah. to Pandora and I will buy a ring to put on Avatar's finger. <laughs> You are really committed to this movie, aren't you? Loving it. I Look, am man. I will. I see this movie on the weekends and don't tell well, anyone. How do you? It. How but do you, how do you, I do like it. Well, well, Mark, if you're gonna do this, because you know how they say that if you're the friend, you're in that weird space of like, do you tell your friend when your movie is cheating on you? How do you feel about this movie cheating on like seven different in seven different lawsuits? In in the in, in 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 a papyrus hell that that got so made fun of it ended up on SNL. How By do you way, do? Actually, I tell you about this? Time out. Papyrus. That is a whole thing that I want to get to after Mark's answer. <laughs> that well, okay. The papyrus. First of all, Jacqueline, I want to hear a scene that you have that is because you seem to be on the lower side of fresh with this movie. What is the scene to you that says that's why this movie works? Well, I started like I've already said the the one where it's like, you know, the Jake body thing in the ending. I know that's like towards the end and it's not saying that like that's the only thing about it, but just how well that worked. Some endings are good enough that you can say that. And I think that ending is one of them. But earlier in it, there's tons of stuff that really I personally think is amazing. And a lot of it has to do with Michelle Rodriguez's character. I love her. Like, I think she is like the best. She's essentially playing the same character that she plays every time, but I will say this is my favorite turn of that. I was just really upset that they killed her. Although, it, I mean, if you want to suspend disbelief on anything, it is way less believable that the one plane that is flying against all the other planes somehow makes it out. Like that, you know, that was a suicide mission. But I really loved everything that she had to do. And like, just the... I know it's visuals, but thinking about like the scene where, you know, Jake and Nituri, like she's telling him, oh, you can find a woman. That's gorgeous. Like how you have to be like soulless not to be in that moment and like fall in love with them falling in love a little bit. Like it was so good. I'm sorry. We call these three Sutraya Mokri, the tree of voices. The voices of our ancestors. from the wood of home tree. And you may choose a woman. We have many fine women. Ninat is the best singer. Well, I don't want Ninat.
that scene i mean that that was the like i was saying the broken clock twice a day thing that was one of the scenes that i was like wow this is this is i mean the visuals there again you brought up the little spinning animals the little rainbow animals that that conversation that dialogue to me was actually very beautifully done uh like i i'm not saying that it is universally a bad movie across the board i think the other scene that is like really wonderful for me is when jake first gets in his avatar and can walk again and just the wonderment of like oh my god i can run and everybody's like dude stop and they're not getting no you don't get it i can run and that's why he just he doesn't have to say the words he just shows us he just takes off it's absolutely amazing hey marine grace well who'd you expect numb nuts think fast motor controls looking good <laughs> so if I just give y'all better, smoother dialogue then, because I, I feel like the, the interactions, it might just be because I'm so entrenched in, in Star Wars just in my daily life with my family. Um, I feel like this, this dialogue is, even when it's explaining sequences and, and, and it's giving away key plot points, it feels so much more natural to me than anything I saw in the prequels. So... It is such a giant leap from that. And sorry, George, the effects in this are markedly better than anything I saw in the prequels. And so this is visually and I guess from a script standpoint, what I would have wanted from episodes one, two and three, because I felt like I really was in in the world. You know, even when I'm watching things that that upset me or it, it felt it, it I'd never felt manipulated because James Cameron has a history of making some pretty cool movies where you're rooting for the Marines to take down the aliens. And that's the way this is set up. We even have like a more modern load lifter that our boy Stephen Lang gets in. But then we have to change our allegiance as viewers from, oh, wait, now we're rooting against the very same things that we would have sent to kill Xenomorphs. Now, <laughs> wait, wait, were we wrong about Xenomorphs? Were they really nice and with, with the cool two drippy mouths? And, no. and maybe we invaded their planet, too. So I, I just have all these existential questions <laughs> leaving this movie, and I can't stop thinking about it, Winston. I mean, I, I, I understand. I get it. I get there's so much going on here. I, I just... It's one of those things that if you, I have seen this narrative done so much better in Pocahontas, in Fern Gully, that like, you need to give me a reason to be here. And visuals the visual? by themselves are not enough. That's not enough though. That you, cause you could have applied those it, visuals. It's not the only thing that's there, but like that is, it's, it's the Simone Biles thing. Look, it's the Simone Biles thing. And I will go back to this when we talk about this specific movie. You have to look at the level of difficulty. You have to look at what they were trying to pull off. Is the dialogue stilted at time? Absolutely. Does the narrative drag on? Is there really clunky exposition? Absolutely. But they are literally building a world and, an, and a thing. And the one thing you never can criticize is although this stuff is weird, for the most part, they put it in a position of believability. You would absolutely, Elon Musk, like incarnate, that's the Giovanni Ribisi character. And this was 10 years ago. You know what I mean? Like, you know what I mean? Like this tech guy who's like coming out in the middle of nowhere to go, like that's plausible. I got a, I got a question. Have, have either of y'all played any of the, like the, the Oculus Rifts or anything like that uh, with any of the VR stuff? I I've will not subject my head to that. No, <laughs> I've done like a trade panel where you put it on for 10 minutes, but okay. I don't consider that. Play. Okay. I, I bring this up in the sense that I remember when I first put on one of those VR headsets, uh, they had some very basic games that developers had come up with. There was like five games for this thing. And at the time you're like, holy crap. I can't believe this the VR thing is real. Like this looks so cool, et cetera, et cetera. Years later, I wouldn't touch any of those games with a 10 foot pole because it's one of those situations where one at the time when it's that brand new kind of element, you're like, okay, cool. But there was no, there was nothing deeper about it 
to keep me engaged. In this particular moment, again, with this narrative having been done so much better previously, I am not engaged in this story as much. There are moments, again, the, the moment of him walking again, the moment of him falling in love, the final moment with the transfer, those are all moments that keep me engaged in the film, but they're so sparsely in between other things. I, I do like the scene of him connecting with uh, the animal. You know what I would have preferred to have seen? Him actually have to take down the giant pterodactyl. That would have been amazing. That you want a you want a visual? Yeah. How about a fight between? How about a fight between? That sounded like they were like, we don't have time for this. And but that's my (laughs) but that's my problem. How you gonna give me the baddest mother in the land? And we're just like, he ain't expect nobody from the sky. And that's it. Okay, so you so you still a sky person is what you telling me? You still part of the sky people? You oh my god, I just it it was one of those things where it's like the moments where I needed you to show me. You didn't always do that. Like that would have been a, that would have been probably one of the coolest moments of the entire film. If I had, I would have gotten maybe a little less of the fight with his primary one and give it what, what was it? It was called the 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 oh god, I want to say the Goro the the Garuk Taro or something. Oh, Taruk Makdo. Taruk Makdo. Okay. Makdo. Makdo. Man. Mm-hmm. Oh. Um, well done. Yeah. <laughs> a team effort. It, it, it really was. Get it, like to know what this be like because we already ran away from him so this would have essentially been the sequel fight so you got you teased me with that fight early when you had to run from him but i don't get to see you take him down or like become one with him or work out a deal or something. like that's th- that to me hey, is the you know what maybe feedback. you'll get to see it in the sequels because but they're that- friends now they're friends. I mean, but you maybe only to see that scene, like what that moment that you wanted, maybe not with Jake Sully, but in general, you might get to see someone to do it. But actually that brings us to like, let's let's take it into this next section and sort of talk about the other things that are, that are part of this, uh, specifically the industry, like the fact that we're about to have more sequels and the fact that like, again, there's a whole... There's a whole dialogue around this movie that has nothing to do with what, what's on screen that has sort of like changed how people think about it. And the one place I'm gonna start, we already teased it earlier, papyrus, listen. I'm not gonna lie to you, that whole papyrus thing, it is like the, it's like once you see it, you can't unsee it. It's like when you realize that the Colonel with his bow tie looks like the Colonel has a small body. Like once you see that, you can't unsee it. Like once you see the arrow and the like FedEx sign, you can't unsee it. Like so this is the way it is with Papyrus. Wendy. Like once you realize that they literally took the ghetto Microsoft font and put that into a billion dollar movie, Yep. Yo, I mean, the, the, the one more for your, you can't unsee it. Have you ever noticed that the collar on Wendy's spells out mom? That one gets yes, me every time. Yes, yes. That one gets but me But it's every like time. that. But like once you know that this is like, that that's what it is. And Saturday Night Live, quite rightly, um, for folks that don't know, Saturday Night Live did a spoof of Papyrus with Ryan Gosling, where he's just like, like basically the fact that Avatar did Papyrus is like living rent free in his head and he can't let it go. And he's like (laughs) running to everyone like a thoughtless child, just just like you're ripping leaves off in the forest. You just, he did it. (laughs) Avatar. The giant international blockbuster used the papyrus font as its logo. Avatar, the movie from like nine years ago? Yeah, he just highlighted Avatar, he clicked the drop down menu, and then he just randomly selected papyrus like a, like a thoughtless child just wandering by a garden, just yanking leaves along the way. And so now you're worried about the sequels that are coming out? They're making more? Yes, I, well, I think I heard that one. So they changed the artwork. They fixed it. Um, it looks similar. It's a fun <laughs> rabbit hole to go down online because I had no idea what anybody was talking about with this papyrus font usage for the title in Avatar, but it's pretty hilarious it reminded me of well, when i saw rogue one for the first time and you're expecting like the beautiful star wars font and you just get this weird rogue one a star wars story it just looks like somebody <laughs> yeah. made it that morning and you're like wait this is <laughs> okay i mean i'd rather have a great movie with great effects than a cool title card but is there no department to handle this 
<laughs> You're not wrong. The budget bro. was stretched. The budget was stretched. Stretched um, for a title card. I, <laughs> but James Cameron I- investing so much of his time, and, and this is where James Cameron is coming off of making the biggest movie of all time to that point. He made Titanic. He did Terminator 2. He did Aliens. He did The Abyss. He did all these cool movies. And you're like, what's next with this guy? Because he's just he's a home run hitter who never strikes out. So what's he going to do this time? And we had heard that he's pioneering all these new filmmaking techniques and all of this performance capture that's just a super immersive process for the actors. And it's so time consuming to make. And it's going to be in 3D. And it's going to be this entirely different world. I had the pleasure. I don't know how I got invited to this thing. At one of the uh, IMAX theaters in Hollywood, they showed 16 minutes of Avatar six months before the movie was released. And I went there. I think it was me. Christian Harloff might have gone with me. My good friend, great comedian Mike Black just happened to be there. And so we watched it and we walked out and our jaws were on the floor. Like, what the hell? We, I cannot wait to go see this thing because it was brand new filmmaking techniques and they pulled it off. And it spawned a craze in 3D. It's almost like every other movie saw that and went the papyrus route. They're like, okay, we're not going to do any of that other stuff that James Cameron did because that looks really hard to do. But we're going to trick up our ticket prices and throw these clunky 3D glasses at every movie that comes out since Avatar. I mean, so much so that James went back and made Titanic 3D. Yeah, right. (laughs) I, I, I mean, again, I get it. I get the time and what was going on that we had a lot of stuff going on. Oh, nine, man. Like, well, we just had the first black president. Uh, you know, you got you got new. Th- th- this new technology is crazy. Uh, I mean, like you said, YouTube was only a few years old at that point. I think we were still dealing with like Numa Numa and stuff like that, which is dope. Like, <laughs> like there, there was a lot going on. This was back like in Tay- Drake was Tay- around. You know, yeah. <laughs> like the, he had just gotten hot on the scene. Uh, the, uh, so far gone had been a big deal. Wait a minute. Who was um Chocolate Rain? What was that dude's name? Tay Zonday. That was that era of YouTube kids. That is for the for the older millennials. Ex- exactly. I was I, I had just uh, when, when did this come out? The summer, the summer of 09. It was the Christmas season of 2009. The Christmas yeah. season of 2009. OK, so. I was fresh back from Japan. Like I, I went there. I had studied abroad there earlier in the year. Like there was, there was, it was, it was, it was a hot time, man. Like I, I couldn't wait. And I just, I just remember walking out of that movie just confused because I didn't know how <laughs> I felt about it. Because I did have moments where I was like, hell yeah, and then there were other moments where I was like, what? And so I guess, I guess that's the thing. I, I. Even Titanic, which isn't one of my favorite films, I remember walking out of Titanic with my mind blown and just streaming tears. The reason why I think I don't like Titanic as much now is because I have four sisters and I was dragged to that movie seven times in the theater. Wow. Like, like se- well, six. The seventh was when then I went on a, da- a double date and the girls wanted to go and see Titanic in 3D. So like, I just, I don't like that movie because it, at this, this point, cause it was three hours long and I've seen it seven times. Winston, Winston, yeah, yeah. all I heard in that sentence was you saw Titanic seven times in the theater. <laughs> yeah, my head kind of exploded after that and I really didn't hear why. And I can't give it a justification. You saw that thing seven times. I'm not by I choice. I am a woman and I don't think I've seen it more than four. And I think I had that thing on VHS. Yeah, well, and that that's, the, so if you want to know total times period, it's probably upwards of 20 because the youngest of my siblings, she broke our VHS of it. She watched it so much. <laughs> so like, I just, but but at least when I came out of that film, I was like across the board moved like like man those action sequences were crazy and man that boat and oh my god when the when the lady was putting a baby to sleep and and, and, and and then the water was coming i was like oh lord like to me that was his opus that i get that the technology on this i understand all that but like you want to talk about a story from top to bottom that was so polished and well done and there was a focus more on the story than let's get out this hot technology 
I think to me, that is what's more important about a film. I understand that spectacle, specifically visuals, is what the film medium is all about. But I need you to give me something like deep. I think that's why people connect with the MCU. Like, you know, like you said, sometimes it can be a little bit clunky as far as like the CGI and stuff. They're getting better over the years, etc. But like we resonate with Black Panther because Killmonger is such a gripping story. We resonate with Thanos because like he's a little bit right. Like there's there's things there that are making us jack in. And that, I guess that's my problem is that there's so many times where I couldn't just jack into this story. I mean, I mean, that wasn't the only, you weren't the only person that felt that way. There was a lot of people who felt like the narrative sort of like left them cold, uh, that they didn't feel like they could like key into it. Um, I don't like, again, I, we didn't even talk about the music of this. Like Cameron obviously works with James Horner all the time. Like think about the songs and like towards the end and how they did all that. I just think there was a detail um, like La La Land is not my favorite movie in the world. It just isn't. But the technical achievement of what it was doing as far as the visuals and the and the music and the seamless like synergy between the performances and how they were really able to like transport people, that is incredible. And I will never take anything away from like Damien Chazelle. And I'll never take anything away from James Cameron for doing this because it's like kind of Herculean. And there's a long history because this movie obviously made a ton at the box office and was like this phenomenon that everyone was obsessed with. And it won a ton of awards. Like it didn't win best picture, but it was nominated and mostly for the technological achievement, which is actually hugely in the history of the Academy. Like going back to the very first movie that won for best picture wings it was primarily because they were able to make believable um, airplane fight sequences. Like, yeah, that's why it won. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, and it was, I believe it, it was kind of an upset when it lost to the Hurt Locker, which coincidentally yeah. was directed by James Cameron's ex-wife, Catherine Bigelow. And yep. that was a fun thing to look at, to observe that night at the yeah. Oscars. But the, the budget was reportedly up to about $300 million with this movie. And the fact that it went on to do like two point almost $8 billion worldwide and just got passed last year by Avengers Endgame. I'm not going to say that if Avatar, if you adjust for inflation 10 years ago, because Avatar also, you were charging for the 3D glasses. And I'm not sure a lot of people saw Endgame in 3D or as many people yeah, saw yeah. that as yeah, Avatar. But 3D it, it's was still like huge a, back then. Just a yeah. monster of a movie. Go back and look at the box office when it came out. I think it was December 18th was the first weekend it came out. And it just keeps churning out these monster numbers through February. It spiked again on Valentine's Day. That's how far deep it went into the following year. And so it just it, it is something we all marvel at because then you say, well, it's this huge movie. Where's all the fans? Where's everybody clamoring for a sequel? None of us really were, but now, upon rewatching it and with the knowledge that we have, these what four movies that we're waiting on, the first one I believe is scheduled to come out at the end of 2021. It's like, yeah, 2022, I, 2022. Yeah, yeah, it's December ish 2022. I'm ready. I give it to me now. That is suddenly going to be one of my more anticipated movies of that year because of what I saw and, and how invested I was in the characters. I, I just feel like you're waiting for Godot, man. Like we've been we've been promised that we were that we were gonna get these sequels years and years, and every year it gets pushed another three years, another four years, all that kind of stuff. But just off the Oscar thing itself, there's no way that that Avatar is better than the Hurt Locker. And then they I know they also lost for uh, adapted screenplay, and there's no way that Avatar is better than Precious either. Like that, that, that film as well, you wanna talk about a narrative that really is gripping and just heart-wrenching and infuriating. And like from top to bottom watching that film, you're just like, Hah. like I, the fact that we can't say that about this three hour epic, you know what I'm saying? And it's harder to do that. Maybe that's where you need to find places to trim the fat because maybe that's what hurt it in my mind, honestly, is because at one point I found myself checking my watch, but. Again, that's me. I guess I'm I'm in the, the 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 minority here since you know most people love the film. So well, can it win you oh. over though? Like like can y'all get excited about a sequel? Like, like can you go into the movie theater whenever we get to go in 2022 to go see the sequel and be like, okay, blank slate, you got another chance. We're not worried about. Well, we might be worried about Marines because apparently Stephen Lang is coming back to reprise his role somehow in the new one. But now we just get to immerse ourselves deeper in the world of Pandora and get out of our human brains a little bit. 
again, this movie has weird fascinations. Like I didn't even really even get into the the weird and bizarre things about the whole idea of like her and him having a love affair when she sees him in his other form. Like that was weird. Like you don't need to see that. Like when she was holding him, when he was like real Jake, I was like, this is not romantic. It's strange. But there is a but that, she part of me that sees wants him. to- she listen. sees him. Listen, I get that. <laughs> I get that. Like, go, go ahead. Um, but I'm still about it, man. I want to watch this. It seems like they, like, there is so much to talk about. Like, how are they going to live? They literally made a love story between a fish and a dog. And now they're like, okay, you guys go have a, an adventure together. He's not really like a Navi. He's like, not even really a huge, like a, a human either. He's just there. Um, you've done a weird brain implant. Yeah. Now y'all go have a family. Yeah. Where's their point, house? To that like, point, it's... I will say that I would prefer the life that Sam Worthington's character had leading up to it, where you get to go back to being a human every so often. You go back to have a nice breakfast of sausage and scrambled eggs you scarf down before you go back hanging out with the Navi. Now you're waking up, and like y'all said, my fantasy is is Tom is being Tom Hanks and Castaway on the island, and I love that fantasy until I get to okay, wait, but then I'm on the island for like a week, and then there's no Starbucks, uh, there's no Grubhub. Uh, Postmates won't deliver there. And so then you start thinking about all the practical things of really shedding your humanity. How much do you love her, Sammy? How much? Because this is permanent now. Hey, man. I mean, there are expats all over the world that do that. I will I will give him that. It will be interesting to see. I wonder if in the sequel, if James Cameron will like rip from Dragon Ball Z and his son becomes like one of the first super Navi. You know what I'm saying? Because he's half Navi, half human, and he can tap into some deeper powers. You know what I'm saying? Like, that could be interesting. I I'll, I will watch the film. I have a feeling that, like, even though it was so, you know, critically acclaimed, I would bet the criticisms, the lawsuits, all of that has probably rung in James Cameron's head to piss him off and want to make the movie even better. And I, I hope well, that it Well, tell people about the lawsuits, because I don't think we explain that for Sh folks that maybe... Sure. So there, there is a history of lawsuits with James Cameron in a lot of his films. Um, there's, I mean, there were ones... Th there have been, there have been a number. I mean, the people coming in yeah, for Mark Terminator. Yeah, Mark gave some... A little bit, yeah. yeah. So what, there was, there was Terminator, Terminator 2 Judgment Day, True Lies, Titanic, Dark Angel... They all had lawsuits that people brought up, some that were acknowledged, most that were kind of thrown out. But there was a whopping, as of last count, eight lawsuits against Avatar. Some of them really are people just kind of being like, nah, man, miss me with all that. But like, for example, the, the one that sticks out the most is the most recent one uh, from Roger Dean, who made, who's a visual artist that made claim that, you know, Cameron took images from his fantasy paintings and they're directly involved in Avatar. And you can see that in like the main, the, the I, I already have forgotten how to pronounce the, the giant pterodactyl creature, but like the, the, the photo that's used in like this article here, like you can instantly see, oh my God, there it is. And there's a follow-up with the, the picture of like the, the mountains that is all the, like the floating mountains, the idea of that, those are two images that are very clearly in the film and you could definitely see where this compares but a lot of these other stuff people talking about like i brought a, a pitch to james about this about like an indigenous tribe and like a mining thing and and they give their various examples some the judges uh, agree with some that they don't but to have i get that maybe it's a common theme of like the colonizer and the indigenous people and 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 having that kind of go but like some of these when you look at them to see where they're at and to know that it was like, hey, so-and-so submitted their idea or their script to Lightstorm Entertainment. And then all of a sudden, it seems like all of these ideas kind of combined, like, you know, uh, the, the Planeteers and made Captain Planet. Like that's, that's something to be concerned about a little bit. So I just hope that like going forward, and that might be why narratively it was a little bit of a, didn't click because it was, you know, trying to mix and match jigsaw pieces. I hope that the sequel, now that you've set up your world building, that this does ring as true. As, like, as Terminator 2, to me, is so much better than the original Terminator. I would hope that that's what happens with Avatar 2, is that this is so much better than the original, 
that I'm, I'm immediately like, yo, Avatar 1 was a classic. And like now Avatar 2 is like, that's that ish, son. So like, I'll be there. I'll give it a shot. Like, it, I'm not gonna throw this in the dumpster bin. Like if this was rotten on my radar, it's like rotten at like a 50. It's not oh. like rotten at like a 20 or a 10. You're going with us, Winston. I, you know? I have full confidence that the new one's winning you over and we're all walking out of that theater together, skipping, holding hands and ready for the Avatar 3. That's how that's how it's gonna feel. <laughs> Fair. Yeah. I mean, listen, I I really hope and pray um at this point he's definitely had enough time. He cannot say he has not had enough time, uh, especially now, even with the pandemic. Also, I just wanna say something that popped into my brain thinking about things because this movie had a long time between sequels. We've been at home within the pandemic for almost a year now and George R. R. Martin is still not finished that <laughs> book. Yeah. And I just want to say that. <laughs> well, okay. In defense. I, it literally I, I, popped I into my brain. Well. <laughs> I'm going to defend George R. R. Martin here because as somebody who does have to write for part of his gigs, um, I am a lot more efficient when I can go to a coffee shop and write. I will set up shop with my little laptop like everybody else's. Family guy made fun of it. I don't care. That's me. I'm productive in a stable environment with a little bit of stimulus around me at home when it's just me and Molly staring at me wondering why dad's home if he's not going to give me more food it gets tougher so George I defend you Winston you on my team I give I give him a pass there so I was very fortunate I was very fortunate in in 2007 when the, the primaries were happening I met Barack Obama right so I have a photo that my parents uh had done for me like a big portrait uh that has the photo of us together it has the article when he was elected like the day of when it was like oh it had yes yes we did or whatever right it's been sitting in the moving box when i moved in here when the pandemic started the entire time yeah. still not hung it up because it is, it is a big ass photo and i don't know where i'm gonna put it and i still haven't figured that out that was the project i gave myself the first week here and it is still in the moving box so it happens I, I will give, and that's not because there's no love for it. I'm sure George R. R. Martin loves wanting to finish Game of Thrones, but like for me, it was laziness. For him, I think he saw his show end and he was like, yeah, I don't know if I need to do this no more. So, uh, uh, so. <laughs> well, hey, that's an episode though. We can talk about the people who are a fan of the last season of Game of Thrones. Not I me. know y'all are out there. <laughs> Hit us up. Hit us up. Uh, Winston, thank you so much uh, for coming. Uh, but before you get out of here, we want to know, since you are a, a guy that is uh, up to date on what is good to see at home, uh, what are you watching? Recommendation on a movie or TV show you want to give our listeners? Of course. Uh, I'm probably late on the train, so most of you have already seen this, but I just uh, watched the entirety of all three seasons of Cobra Kai and my mind is just blown away. If this is a show that you haven't seen yet, uh, you do not need to watch the Karate Kid, the original Karate Kid films to watch it, but I highly recommend you do because the payoffs for doing that are so worth it. Um, but if you're, you know, we're in quarantine, we're gonna, even though the vaccine's rolling out, we're gonna be here for a little bit longer. I would highly suggest go watch the three Karate Kid movies, then go watch Cobra Kai. Uh, I mean, realistically, I got through all three movies and Cobra Kai between uh, a Friday and a Monday. Like I found myself binging an entire season a day. It was just so addictive that when Netflix just let it roll to the, you, you wanna watch the next episode? I say, hell yeah, keep it going. Come on. <laughs> so that would be what I would highly recommend to people right now. I was pretty locked uh, into it, but I'm still only like halfway through season one. So, and, and everybody tells me- That is very typical of Mark. Yeah, that's very typical. Yeah, I, I, I tend to give up uh, before I'm done binging something, but I'm hearing people rave about season three, so I do have to check it out. Uh, I, I do so have quick. a piece of Avatar trivia, but before we get to that, I want to remind everybody you can check out Avatar right now. It also now has the silver medal as the second highest grossing worldwide film of all time losing out to Avengers Endgame. It's also number two on the all-time best-selling Blu-ray list. Can you all name what movie is number one? The best-selling movie all time in Blu-ray form. It's not Avengers Endgame. Uh, is it a Disney movie? It is a Disney movie. Okay, then in that case, 
I'm gonna go with. Gonna have to schmo down you, Winston. Five, I know. I don't know. Four, three. Uh, Avengers, Star Avengers: Wars. Infinity War. Star Wars. Oh, y'all just clung so closely to your Star Wars love, and you couldn't let it go. And Frozen. That actually makes perfect it, sense. Over to Frozen. That the answer's Frozen. Sense. Lucy. Frozen. I bet Lucy knew it the whole time. She's got it. She's got. I a said Lion King, around. but f- yeah, Frankie uh, walks around in her Christmas present, which is an Elsa dress. And there you go. Like, oh. let it go. Yep. What did they it. put in that movie? It has, it's crack. Ch- it's just child, it's like, child, like, child, child, yeah. ca- child just, crack. You didn't, you didn't yeah. know. The yeah. child crack is all through that. Winston, besides insinuating that Disney characters have a, have a <laughs> drug problem, what else are you working on, sir? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, I've got a couple of things going on. Obviously, Blurts in the Hood that was mentioned up top. That is uh, the, the podcast show that me and uh, Jay Washington, myself and Jay Washington do every Tuesday and Thursday, 2 p.m. Pacific. Uh, remember when I asked up top if I could swear on this? We swear a lot on that, so don't don't play this. It's not safe for work. Put some headphones on if you're listening to us uh, while you're at work. But I promise you will bust a gut doing it. We have a good time talking about pop culture, uh, music, movies, politics, all that stuff. We cover it all. Um, and also my show, The Inner Geekdom Show, that uh, airs Fridays at 9 a.m. Pacific time. Uh, we are covering uh, geek comic book news, but a lot of reviews. I'll be reviewing all of uh, WandaVision uh, as the season goes through. So definitely come by, say what's up, hang out with me. Uh, yeah, that's pretty much everything going on at the moment. There's some behind the scenes stuff I can't talk about yet, but we'll we'll cover that next time I get to visit y'all. If y'all will have me back. What's the uh, what's the social media? Is it at the Swaggy Blurred? Yes, at the Swaggy Blurred. T-H-E-S-W-A-G-G-Y-B-L-E-R-D. That's on all socials. Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, Letterbox, all that stuff. Wow. All right, Mark. And folks can follow you at Mark Ellis Live. Uh, any shows coming up, Mark, for you? I did my virtual show on New Year's, and so I'm probably going to go back into the uh, the cryo for a little bit as far as stand-up comedy goes. But I did have a great time on New Year's. Thanks, everybody, for uh, for watching me do a live set virtually. And uh, RIP to our dear friend Jeff Scott, who played the piano for his last performance that very night. Great to see Jeff uh, soaking all the love from all of our fans who had never been to the world-famous comedy store to watch him ply his trades in person. Um, If y'all want to get in touch with us and let us know what movie you think we should be talking about, if you want to be like a Johan Gustafsson, then hit us up anytime. Email us, rtiswrong at rottentomatoes.com. rtiswrong at rottentomatoes.com. Next week, we're getting spicy. Actually, Winston, it's funny you mentioned uh, it a little bit when we were talking before, but we're doing a, we're doing a little DCEU movie. Folks have been having a little bit of conversation about it. I don't know if you've heard of this um, Wonder Woman 1984 movie. Oh, I don't know if y'all heard about it. Oh, my goodness. It. I don't think anybody's been talking Nobody. about it. Nobody. Nobody's Mm-mm. been talking about it. Nobody. It really flew under the radar. Just a, a little bit. Uh, well, no, it actually flew right in the middle of the radar and you know the fireworks they were flying through that so technically they were still should have been able to be seen but that's a whole nother conversation for a whole nother podcast so i can't wait to talk about it i i i haven't even seen the whole movie yet and i think i'm gonna have a complaint because if you call the movie wonder woman 1984 better have some music that came out in the year 1984 and there's a certain album called 1984 that i'm not sure a lot of music from that album was in that movie and so at that jacqueline I'm going to have some thoughts on the music <laughs> for next week. I, I'm sure you're going to have some thoughts. We are really playing in Mark's playground going to 1984 and not bringing his favorite playmates. Anyway, again, thank you all for listening. want to thank our guests, Winston. I want to thank uh, Lucy, producer, Tim Ryan, also our researcher, Mark Hoffmeyer. I'm Jacqueline. Of course, you folks can find me anywhere at that Jacqueline. On behalf of myself and my co-host, Mr. Mark Ellis, we will see you guys next time. And uh, yeah, I don't know, 1984. Let's go.